Hey everyone, thanks for stopping by. My name is Benny Rose and welcome to Press for Time. Today's show is extremely special to us because we have connected with somebody that is, I would say, a man of my heart. He is someone that's in the entertainment industry that has a business that has grown to make an enormous amount of content revolving all the things we love and more. This person is Brian Volkweiss. He is the CEO of Nacelle Company that is responsible for some of the coolest content as far as television shows that deal with pop culture on Netflix, Amazon, and a couple of other channels out there. Hope you enjoy. Take care and have fun. everybody another week another podcast as always i'm your host benny rose and i'm here with the one and only tyler nethers as always but we have a very very special guest today we have the one and only brian volkweiss from the cell company thank you so much for coming on the show today to be with us how are you doing today i'm good and thank you for having me absolutely it's an absolute pleasure for Anybody that's watching the show, uh, we've been hyping this up for quite some time, and uh, it really is a dream come true. And again, we are a casual show that we love to just talk about all the things we love. And realistically, you, your brand, you hit like just about everything that we love. And it's it's such a perfect uh, unity between toys, movies, things we grew up with, comedy. It, it's you are a jack of all trades, and uh, you're a man after my own heart. We, I always say, we want to be Walmart. We don't want to be Tiffany's. <laughs> I like it. That's great. That, that's like, great. Really? I don't know if anybody's ever said that they want to be Walmart before. But my <laughs> point is, like, we, I, I don't want to just do stuff for a tiny audience. You know, like, I love big stuff. Let's talk about big stuff. No, oh, that's fantastic, and uh, that's kind of our mantra too we uh focus on being a variety show because again we're parents we have regular jobs this is something we do for passion and when we have the time we talk about something and every week can be something different so again i think that's a big reason why i definitely attached to a lot of your brands and uh, a lot of your projects that you've produced over the years so again thank you for all you've contributed to the You're entertainment very world you yep. very kind I've always said diversify or die. If you try to stick yourself into one box, everybody else is going to stick you in that box too. Oh, I like that. I like that. I'm going to steal that from you. It's all yours, man. <laughs> so Tyler, if you want to get started, we we basically created a, a little list of some questions that might kind of reach out to different parts of uh, the work that you've done over the years. And we'd like you to take the reins and, you know, get to know, you know, let our audience get to know you if that's okay. Let's do it. Yep. Awesome. So obviously the first thing that I did when I realized that we were going to get to interview you was I went straight to Wikipedia because, you know, that's what everybody does. And I was struck immediately by a little tidbit that one, I want to make sure is true because it's Wikipedia. And two, I want to ask about was your first job, a production assistant on Castaway? Uh, not to split hairs. Uh, it was not my first job. Okay. Uh, but it was within my first five months of my career. Yeah. Uh, and it was one of my first paid jobs, but it was not okay. literally the first job. But yes, I worked on Castaway in the wardrobe department, which there's no greater irony. Um, the Probably for about five, no, probably for about seven or eight months. Okay. Yeah. So what, what was that like? I mean, did you, I guess, did you know at the time that it was going to be I don't punch my microphone as big a thing as it ended up being like your first, you know, as you said, paid real gig were you like holy crap i'm working on a on a tom hanks movie or was it like oh yeah we don't know what this is going to be yet so first of all i have to thank you because i have never been asked about this before and uh i love absolutely love talking about it um i would have been shocked if it wasn't a grand slam it, it was a great script tom hanks was 
Tom fucking Hanks uh, right. at the time. Uh, so, uh, and it was Zemeckis. Yeah. So it, it would have been extremely surprising uh, if it was not a huge hit. So that's the first thing. Um, it was a incredible experience that absolutely changed. Um, it absolutely changed the course of my career for many reasons. Uh, number one, I had come out to L.A. to be a director. And I was just starting to meet people and learn how to do things. And I remember vividly, uh, and I just bear with me because you're, you're probably going to start thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Brian, you direct all the time. Um, if you really dig deep, you'll notice I really only started directing three years ago. Or may, I, sorry, that's not true, about five years ago. But basically they were doing the uh, the... Thanksgiving scene that's in the beginning of the movie. And um, I was watching Zemeckis and he was getting asked all these questions like, you know, am I eating a lot of my food? Am I uh, like listening? Like, and I'm literally watching this and I'm like, oh, I think like when I made student films in high school and college, where you have to do all the jobs yourself. What I was attracted to that I believed was directing was much more about the producerial aspect of directing when it's a student film. Like I didn't want to be there talking about, oh, eat eight pieces of broccoli and you eat all your cabbage, but look at Helen Hunt. Don't look at like, I was watching that and I'm like, I don't want to fucking deal with that stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so that was the first thing. The second thing was while working on Castaway, that's when I had the epiphany of, oh, I need to be involved with this process uh, long before a film is greenlit because I had already been doing product. I had done a lot of commercials and music videos and little films, independent films, whatever. And I basically realized like everything I'm doing is already happening. So if I had never been born, it still would have happened. So I was like, how can I contribute to the process that gets us here? Mm -hmm. So that was where I also had that epiphany. And then the third thing that happened um, on July 1st of this year, I will have been out here for 25 years. Wow. That, I booked that job in 1998. So like I said, I got here in, I got here in July of 98. I started working on that movie, I think in September of 98. So I'm like three months into my career. Mm -hmm. The worst boss I have ever had in my life was on Castaway. Really? And, yes. I mean, by a million miles. And just to be clear, in case anybody's on Wikipedia, I am not referring to Johanna Johnson. Johanna Johnson was wonderful. But believe it or not, when you're the production assistant and you're getting everybody coffee, you are not reporting to Johanna Johnson. Right. So, so but I, I learned a, a really interesting thing about it because what happened was... And again, no one's ever asked me about this before. So I'm actually telling a story that, uh, you know, I might, uh, you know, I wasn't planning on telling the story today, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're literally going to be the first people to ever hear this. Um, they were horrible. I mean, they, they were really mean, really, really mean to me. And that's nothing. I cannot say that about anyone else I have ever worked for in my life. So. The, the only reason I didn't quit was because I just don't quit. And it was like, I mean, there were times I was on the verge of like crying. Like, I yeah. mean, it was horrible. absolutely horrible. The last hour of the last day of working on the movie, I go in to turn in my petty cash. You know, I had all this cash and I had to give it back to them. And then they, you know, whatever, you know, gave me a whatever. It doesn't matter. It was my last thing I had to do when I was wrapping out. And it was all um, it was all women and they were sitting in this room with a big it was like a, a desk shaped like that that filled up the whole room. 
And I walk in, I go up to my boss and she hands me this envelope and I open the envelope. I mean, I think I might even have one here. Um, yeah, yeah, I got, I, I've never talked about this before. This is so crazy. I'm glad I'm at home. Oh no, I don't. I, oh, I do, I do, I do, I do. I got one right here. Wow. Look That's at that. Awesome. Right here, look at this. It was, and you have to remember, I was making like $5 and maybe 50 cents an hour. They gave me $1,000 worth of those things. Wow. Now, I'm in the room. I've worked with them for almost, for more than half a year. I thought they hated my guts and like everything. I'm sorry. I actually, I know, I know you thought you were asking a throwaway question and I'm no. I might even tear up answering this, but um, like I said, I don't talk about this very often. Um, they handed me the thousand dollars worth of things. And just so you know, for the whole time I worked with them, whenever they would be, for lack of a better word, mean, my like tactic for how to deal with it was I would always like preemptively start talking about movies. I would always be like, oh, my God, did you just see this movie? And I, it would literally be a device to try and, like, derail them from being mean so I could get what they needed me to do from them. And then I could leave and go do it. Yeah. So the whole six months we worked together, I kept talking about movies like a fucking lunatic. So they give me this thousand dollars of um, tickets. And I literally looked at my boss and I'm like. What is this? I, and I didn't say I thought you hated me. But I was really close. You, you and wanted to. <laughs> wanted to. This is what she told me. She said, we're all gay. And we're all women. And we've been doing this 30, 40 years. And we've been treated shit. Like shit. By men. And... We have always kind of like always tried to find like these male PAs and see how quick we could get them to quit. And you're wow. the first one ever not to quit. And basically what happened was we started feeling bad for you. And in my head, I'm like, then why didn't you stop being mean? Right. Which yeah. you never did. Course, but anyway, beggars can't be choosers. Um, and we felt really bad for how we treated you. So this is our way of apologizing. Wow. And wow. it and again you have to understand I'm 22 years old. I'm working on my first studio movie. It never occurred to me that women were treated badly. It never occurred to me that gay people were treated badly. And it was just first of all it taught me a lesson don't treat people badly because this is what it feels like. Yeah. But second of all it made me be very conscientious at the very beginning of my career. Women don't get treated like men. Gay people don't get treated like straight people, especially mm -hmm. if you're a gay woman. So to have that knowledge at 22, you know, I'm 46 now, that, listen, would I have enjoyed not being treated like crap for six months? Yes. But that being said, I was able to take that experience with me up until this very second. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's uh it's a very Isn't emotional, crazy? you know, when you yeah. think about the world and you know, obviously I would say we're we're a little bit younger. I think Tyler's a bit younger than me, so we have kind of you know a little bit of an age gap, but I remember that time and how different the world was. And you know, you have that thought process now, you know, it's it's almost expected, unfortunately, because that's just the way the world is now. But yeah. back then, everything was tolerant. You know, everybody just, hey, it's normal. That's the behavior. That's what do people do. That's the way yeah. the world works. Yeah. And it's incredible that, you know, it's a life lesson. And thank you for sharing that so much because it's really yeah. valuable oh, yeah. to nowadays. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it was just valuable for the world we're in now and how important that is, you know, in the world we are in with all the struggles of people, you know, being traded unfairly for any part of their, their being. Yeah. It's easy to forget how things were 25 years ago, let alone before we were born. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. 
And I want you to know that was not a throwaway question. That was the question I was most excited for. So I wanted to it's, ask it first. It's because literally the top of our list. It's, yeah, it's number. It's my number one question because. So I mean, Benny. Benny knows, but I am a. I am like the biggest movie nerd, and I'm all about having like weird little facts about stuff. So. You know, I was going through and I, that was the one thing that struck me the most on the page was like, there is no way you were you started on Castaway. That's amazing. So oh, I had to. You, if you're a fan, I'll tell you one more story. Yeah, um, I I'm a huge space buff. And I mean, I bonded with Hanks like he was at craft service and I just started talking to him about Apollo 13. Yeah. And then he was coming up to me like, did you know this? Did you know that? Yada, yada, yada. And then his driver, uh, I think, uh, ironically, he was fine, uh, but he got into a car accident. And I uh, literally, for three or four days, uh, in my Honda CRV, uh, would pick Hanks up from his house and drive wow. him to set. And he asked for me. He sat in the front seat with me, and it was it was insane. I mean, it was absolutely uh, absolutely insane. Yeah, yeah, that wow. that's incredible. I would seriously, I would Jealous. lose my mind. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, awesome. he was wonderful. Hanks was wonderful. It it was a great experience. Yeah, that's that's good. I'm glad you had not only the good life lesson, but also good experiences around the the poor treatment. To essentially get you through the day when you think about it, you know, that right. part of the journey, we're always going to have those rough patches and you look for those little things to get you through and a reminder right. of why we do what we do in our life. I'm glad I had the experience. I, I, if I were offered the ability to take it out of my memory, I would not do that. Yeah. You would hope to make it a little better. I was just going to (laughs) say, yeah, no, I can imagine. I think we probably all have that one. Sure. That, you know, at least one. Yeah. Yes. I would say more than one. Unfortunately. (laughs) I'm lucky. That's the only bad boss. I ever had. I, I never really. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't mean I didn't have conflict with people. I did all the time. Don't get me wrong, but right. woo, that was crazy. Yeah. No, thank yep. you again for sharing that. Yeah. Tyler, Benny, I'll um, kick it over to you, man. It's okay. your turn. We're going to go, if that's okay, into my love and the thing that we have in common, the love of toys. Uh, I'm probably, I would say, I hope to be one of your biggest fans of the Toy Story near you. And uh, a big part of that is growing up as a child in uh, Brooklyn, New York, I had the pleasure of my late father owning a comic book store. So I was, I was in that life of a brick and mortar for a long time. And uh, my father was one of the first stores to sell toy biz figures uh, for for Marvel. And uh, yeah. So when your show came out, I just fell in love with the fact that you're, you're so down to earth with connecting with the part of our businesses in the world that struggle the most. I feel, you know, the mom and pops, And at the time that you did it with uh, the pandemic, you know, and how relatable each store, you know, had a story that helped keep them going through it. And, uh, you know, as you're going through that process, obviously you have to scout for locations. So my main question was, is that something that you kind of take the reins with of, you know, I've been to this store or I've heard of this store. Well, let's get this on the list. Do you have other people um, that you work with that you know have the same passion that you say all right let's go check this state let's see what shops they have let's see what they have and um, you know I'm just curious what a little bit if you can share some of that process of what makes you decide on some of the locations you've chosen yeah so between the shows that have aired and the shows that are in post-production we have basically done about 50 episodes um of those 50 stores now keep in mind i've signed off and i've approved every single one i've had a couple submitted to me that i rejected for various reasons but of all 50 stores i have literally only picked out of like me saying we're doing this once and it was the first episode interesting every other episode uh the team that i work with they have stores that for one reason or another, personally or business wise, um, it just makes sense for us to do something. So what I care about the most, the personality of the owners, like that's everything. Um, and then that's 90%. And 10% is I really want to have geographic diversity. 
Like, like I don't want to do 50 stores in Chicago. Right. So I'm very at, like, I want to do one store in every state. You know, we've done a couple of foreign, you know, we did a store in China, a store in England. Uh, we have a couple of foreign stores in post right now. Um, awesome. So um, that's really all I care about. And the, the, the stores that I have rejected, it's usually because either they're not really a toy store like there'll be a record store that sells toys and it'll be like 96.5% records, like 3.5 toys. And I'm right. like, yeah, yeah, sorry to be the party pooper, but that is not a toy store. Right. Um, and then sometimes there's a great store, but the owner, you know, just doesn't really pop and doesn't right. want to be on camera. So you'll get people that want to be on the show because it helps their business, but that's the only reason they're doing it. They don't really want to be on camera. Makes sense. And they, they, they essentially use it as like a marketing stage versus, you know, a, no, chance, that's a, fine. a chance to tell their story, which no, no, we, to me we is, want them. That's we right. want them to use it as a marketing tool. That was the whole reason we started the show in the first place, but they may not agree with me, but me saying no to personalities that I don't think will pop, that's kind of doing them a favor because yeah, it's not good for the show to have an owner that doesn't want to be on camera. And then if that's how people perceive that store, right. they could actually lose business. No, that's a very valid point. I didn't think about that, but yeah, I mean, um, I'm sure we've all been to that store where you go in and you kind of get treated, I would say, as an example, like a GameStop, where you just walk in and you hope that somebody asks you if you need help. But, you know, you kind of really have the mindset of a mom and pop shop is going to give you that family feel, yeah. and really take yeah. care of you. And unfortunately, there's some stores out there that don't do that. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'll yeah. say I don't have a lot of experience with like toy stores, but like especially in high school and stuff going into card shops. And go in places to try to play D and D or play Warhammer or play Magic. And you go into some of these shops, and the owners will come around and and critique the way that you're playing and stuff like that. And it's like I don't want to play. In, I don't want to play here. I don't want to be a. I don't want to be a part of this. What's wrong with you? Or you ask. You want to ask questions, and everyone acts bothered by the question. Like, oh, you should already know this. Like, no, stop. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'll go somewhere else. This isn't yeah. for me. It's weird, but yeah, it's, I'm the same. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm very surprised that you've only chosen one just because of one thing I love, too, is the intro that you do for each show. It makes it very personal. Nobody does that. And to me, that just gives me that vibe that, you know, you really care about this. And I know you do, but more in the sense of thinking that you potentially selected that location. Well, but I become obsessed with the stores during production. True. So. I'll tell you something else that if you don't know this, it'll blow your mind. If that other thing blew your mind, I didn't have any interest whatsoever in He-Man at all. 0, 0.0. I didn't even want to do He-Man in season one or two. And the crew basically convinced me to do it. Why well, now I have an 80, 90 piece He-Man collection. <laughs> I love <him. laughs> So I get really into whatever I direct or produce and that's that. So, by the way, to your point, one of my favorite things in the world is going to stores that we do episodes about that I then go to the store. Right. So which like, I love seeing, too. And you always find something that you like, which is fantastic. Yeah. Because what are so the like odds? I was in Detroit a month ago and I went to two stores that we had already done episodes about. So, like, that is the greatest thing in the world. Fantastic. No, thank you yeah, so much really for cool. sharing that. I love it. Tyler, I, I think you have a lot of different diverse questions, which is great. So um, if you want to take the reins. Yeah, sure. So um, I will say I've watched all the movies that made us. And one of my favorite parts is I you're not the only person doing documentary style film documentaries that talk to the editors, but you are one of the only people that focus on film editing. <laughs> And to me, that is that is such a huge part of creating a movie. I mean, there's no there's no, uh, you know, Scorsese wouldn't be Scorsese without Shoemaker. 
old Tarantino wouldn't be where he was without Mankey. I mean, Pulp Fiction would not Pulp Fiction would not be a good movie without the editing work that was done, in, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I think it's funny the cross of the I know you didn't I don't think you um, produced the Patton Oswalt talking for clapping, but where he said he he compares film editing to the creation of a child and says that, yeah, the director shoots all this film and he got 30 hours of film. And then the editor's like, okay, go on out now so I can make a movie out of these heaps of film you've given me. Um, and that's so cool to have, to have that perspective um, from that show. I don't think that's really a question. That's just more, I want to tell you that's an awesome thing. Yeah. I figured that out before I even got to Hollywood. I mean, I, I knew that in high school, like I would watch and I'd be like, why did cinematographers keep getting directing gigs? They're horrible at it 90% of the time. And yet editors that become directors always seem to be some of the best directors who ever lived. Yeah. So I had that theory from childhood. Mm -hmm. And then when Toys That Made Us got greenlit, which is the first thing we've done of this pop culture uh, uh, path we're on, I was very clear from the beginning, editors and lawyers, Everybody forgets about the editors and the lawyers. Find the lawyers. More important than anything, find the lawyers. Because the lawyers, in a similar way to the editors, but for obviously very different reasons, the lawyers are the only people at a company that see everything. Yeah. The marketing people only see the marketing. The production people only see the production. But the lawyers oversee all of it. And it's the same thing with editorial. They're the ones looking at all the footage, all the people worked on. They're mm -hmm. hearing what's going on on set. They know what's not put in the movie. So that was very deliberate. And we've been doing that almost from, from the jump. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And that is definitely, I feel like a lot of people don't, I mean, almost nobody considers that stuff outside of Oscar season. And nobody's talking about unless you're really into like film circles, I guess. People don't don't care about who edited the movie. They want to see the director's name. They want to see the stars and the rest of it. They're like, well, the rest of it just happened on its own. <laughs> it just kind of came together. So it's really cool to see to see those kind of, you know, shout outs and stuff like that. So. No, that's just that's cool. That's so cool. Um, so I had, I had another question. So like Benny kind of said at the beginning, your brand kind of exists at this nexus of toys and movies and stand up comedy, um, uh, where like in, in your opinion, how does all that tie together? Because those are distinct, you know, genres of stuff, but you somehow bring it all together and fit a little bit of all of it into all of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to answer this is to tell you what we don't do, because the list of what we do do is forever. Yeah. But the list of what we don't do will show you the commonality of everything we do do, which is we just don't do anything dark. Our goal is when something we make is finished, which at this point now includes toys and books, we want people to feel better about the world than they did before they hit play or before they opened the book. Um, we want to give people joy. So that doesn't mean we don't talk about dark things. That doesn't mean we don't have moments that make people cry. Of course we do. But we'll never make a show about cheating wives, killing other cheating wives. Like, right. like we just don't, and I'm not criticizing it. It's just, it's not what I want to put out into the world. I want yeah. people to enjoy the time they spend consuming whatever it is we made and they paid their hard money for. No, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And that is absolutely the commonality between toys, movies, comedy, and books. I mean, no, that's great. Benny, I know you had a couple other things you wanted to hit. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions from uh, a friend, a couple of friends of ours, a uh, different podcast called media masterminds. Uh, again, when I mentioned that we had this opportunity uh, one of the guys was really, really excited. And I said, hey, maybe you can ask a question. So this is coming from Dr. Joe. And uh, he wanted to ask pretty much, what's the thought process bringing in uh, some to older toy lines like you've been doing, uh, especially with like Biker Mice from Mars and, you know, 
rights are always going to be one of the biggest things. Licensing. I know with your uh, first toy line, you had some cease and desist letters that were sent your way. And we there was did. a lot of, you know, a lot of challenges with that. But uh, do you think about like the licensing process in the sense of, all right, I might be able to get this because it's older or like, I just really want this brand and I'll, let's see what the process is like. You know, is there a, a mindset when you're deciding on which brands you want to revive? So, you know, it's a multi-level answer. Um, there's, you know, we're building a shared universe. So at this point, it's now very important to us as we're trying to get other IPs. Does it make sense within the, our shared universe? So like with RoboForce, I killed myself to get RoboForce. It was a really hard deal to get closed, but we got it. But let's pretend we didn't get it. Let's pretend we didn't even know about it being available. Last year, um, we were in a 14, 15 month bidding war um, that we would have won, by the way, except uh, uh, there was a very unfortunate curveball. Um, but we were in a bidding war with MGM to buy the rights to Robocop because there's a rule uh -huh. called Sonny Bono Law that basically says anybody who creates something, they get it back after 40 years. So the two writers of RoboCop wrote it and then Orion bought it and then MGM bought it. But the Sony Bono law meant that in 2022, they lost the rights. So we were in a bidding war that I believe we were winning until Amazon bought MGM. And then all of a sudden, uh, MGM yeah. seemed to have a little bit more pocket change. But the point, the reason I'm telling you that is, had we won RoboCop, and then we heard that RoboForce was available, I don't know if we would have bought RoboForce, right? Because we already had a robot and a world. Listen, man, I love RoboForce so much. We probably still would have bought it. I've always loved that that crazy, stupid little toy line. But so that's the first thing. The second thing is, can we afford it? Um, so that's obviously a major variable. And then also, can we get a deal done? I mean, we talk to owners constantly that have a, something that's generated $5,000 in the last 10 years that want to get paid a million dollars. So obviously, we're not going to buy that. Right. Um, so that's sort of how we do it. Okay. No, that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm kind of blown away with the RoboCop thing. So yeah. the fact that it shows it shows more of your love, <laughs> which is uh, oh, awesome. one of one of my favorite movies of all time. Because I do remember when uh, you were posting the videos about those letters you received when you were going through the RoboForce, and you were reading, and <laughs> you know, I I saw the frustration in your eyes, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that you were able to. Uh, acquire that license and get the product made and no it, it was great and i wish i could tell everybody what we worked out but i can't because of the, the way that contract works but no, of course it, it definitely worked out better for us than had it never happened we got something we needed very badly in exchange for giving the rights back or giving the name back oh, got great it. understood no very thank cool, you for yeah. sharing that as well one last thing about the toy lines. Is there a toy line? I would obviously you can't disclose if you're working on something, but is there a toy line that you would love to kind of revisit and maybe in the future it's like this is something I'm looking to to get to. I mean, there's tons, but sometimes they're not available because they're owned by Hasbro or Mattel or a company that has no reason to get like I want I love. I mean love pops. You remember Cops? Did you guys ever see it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I want that show so badly, or that IP. And, you know, we'll never get it. Um, it. So, But we're negotiating now with another property that if we get, I mean, it. I, listen, I still cannot believe we own Biker Mice from Mars. Which like, is incredible. I so feel like I'm lying when I say that out loud. Thank you. But if we get this other thing we're negotiating on now, I mean, it's it's literally, it doesn't even make sense to me. I mean, you have to understand, four years ago, 
80% of our business was stand-up comedy. Yeah. Like, so the fact that here we are in 2023 and we're talking about sectors and Garlu and Roboforce and biker mice, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Incredible time to be a, yeah. to be a collector and a fan. Yeah. So. It's nuts. And um, just with your pal passion and your knowledge, um, do you see that there has been like a major resurgence of like third party companies that are kind of jumping on the, you know, let's make a license that we're passionate about, obviously may not have the the funds to do it the legal way. So obviously they'll release things, changing names. Like for me, I'm a diehard mask fan from the eighties. And uh, there's a toy company out there that is working on a couple of their third parties. Uh, we won't go into names and such, but uh, you know, it's, it's to me, it's great as a fan to see that somebody's putting the effort you know, obviously that when they can't go through the legal properties of getting that license and things like that, do you look at that stuff and say, you know, Hey, somebody's kind of working on that. Maybe I won't step in that direction. Like if, have you found any branch, uh, licenses that you may have wanted that you maybe see a third party, uh, working on? If I understand the question correctly, I mean, we would never do anything that we didn't own the copyright to. And I, right. You know, on the one hand, I understand if somebody loves mask and they talk to Hasbro and Hasbro says no. I understand that person making their own toys for themselves and maybe right. giving some away to their friends. But no, I do not support people making money right. on a copyright that Hasbro spent money to create, took all the financial risk to produce the toys. I, I think that's uh, very wrong and obviously uh, very illegal. Of course, um, yeah. of course. But the interesting thing about this period in time, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know, Hasbro spent 20 years trying to sue out of existence people that made fake Transformers. And then finally, about five or six years ago, somebody at Hasbro was like, wait a minute. Why don't we just partner with them and get some more money? Mm -hmm. So you're All seeing a licensing lot of licensing opportunities. Yeah. So yeah. like the person you're referring to who's making the mask stuff, I hope they reached out to Hasbro because well, I think yeah. there's a good chance Hasbro would have been cool about it. Yeah, it looks like it's a it's been a mixed bag from that from what I've seen. It seems like some of their products they actually have licensing, like a, the they've done Silverhawks. And it looks like they had the legitimate license with that. And oh, a I lot know of times you can, yeah, I know, I know <laughs> that's exactly. why I said, <laughs> I figured you did. Cause obviously it looks like that's a license that also, I love that a couple of companies have approached and super seven is also it's doing the it. weirdest license I've ever seen. How do they have that license? It's the exact same license as super seven. Well, I think I'm wondering if they shared it, like you said, like certain companies will allow it. I don't know the legalities of that, if they can allow multiple companies to make, well, sure they toys. can. Yeah. Absolutely. They just do a non-exclusive deal, which is why you can go to Target and see NECA, Super 7, and a couple other companies are all making the exact same Leonardo and Donatello. Um, well, it's is... the weirdest thing in the world to me. And then you have Playmates back in the game, too, and getting upset, which I can understand at this point because everybody's, yeah. you know, jumping on the turtle craze. It's the weirdest thing in the world, what they've done with turtles. But Viacom needs money. Right. No, that makes sense. Badly. No, thank you. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. But thank you. Thank you for that. Tyler. Hey, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up here. Like I said, I know, I know you, your time is valuable. I wanted to, I wanted to hit kind of on the, kind of on the same page as what you were saying. Like you want to put positive stuff out in the world and, and things that make people happy. So I wanted to just give you a last, a last minute opportunity to talk about like, I was curious if you had favorite a favorite film or like a couple favorite films, um, favorite toy line, and whether or not you had a holy grail that you wanted for yourself, like a like a toy that you wish you could get your hands on, but it's like ah, uh, there's just no way to to do that feasibly. So for the movie and the toy, it's sort of uh, the first part is the same answer. Um, Star Wars and Star Trek are always number one. Okay, but. Star Wars changed. I mean, Star Wars, I live in L.A. I'm raising Californian kids because of Star Wars. My entire career is because of Star Wars. Yeah. So I don't feel 
like when people say to me, what's your favorite movie? Like Star Wars changed my life and Star Trek. I'm not religious. I wasn't in the military. Star Trek gave me a code by which I try to live my life. So also neither one of those things is just a movie or just a toy. So I always kind of discount them. Yeah. So what is my favorite movie that's not Star Wars or Star Trek? There will be blood, which is probably very surprising. That's not um, surprising at all. Yeah. Well, like I said, there's no lasers. So that's why most people are surprised. <laughs> so then what's my favorite toy? If I remove Star Wars and Star Trek, got to be G.I. Joe. Okay. Yeah. Got it. USS love- Flag. I got my flag. Uh, I, I, I have almost every single vehicle from the original line, 80% of the figures, so much merch. Um, I love G.I. Joe. And then the holy grail that I don't have is Blix, uh, an incredibly obscure character uh, from droids and the most in-demand production figure from all of Star Wars. Really? They go for... Uncarded, ten thousand to fifty thousand. Carded, wow, eighty thousand to two twenty. Incredible. Good lord. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a lot of money. I would say that definitely justifies the Holy Grail category. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. I'm pretty good on my Holy Grails. I got one of my last ones. Um, I think this year, maybe late last year. Uh, but yeah, it's. I think I'm down to Vlix. Very cool. It's- I, I I see it in your future. I think you want it bad enough. <laughs> I do. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. So when people ask me the same, like the favorite movie question, I have to give the exact same disclaimer about uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, because I grew up, I grew up, you know, my dad read The Hobbit and he read Lord of the Rings to me when I was a kid. And like, I was reading them all through high school, watched the movies as they came out with my dad at the theater when they were doing midnight releases and you could go and stay up all night and watch them. Like that's such a, it's such a huge part of who I am now and what got me into all the things that I'm into. So I always give the qualifier like, okay, well, I'm not going to talk about Lord of the Rings. You want to know my favorite Lord of the Rings is its own thing. We'll talk about movies and there will be blood is in my top four. So you're, nice. you're not far off. That is, nice. that is a perfect movie. Like there's no, I have no notes. There's nothing that I can, <laughs> not a single thing on the worst day that I could complain about with that movie. We, we have that in common. Yes. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Uh, cool. Thank you guys. Yeah. yeah thank this you, was, man. This was, this was this so was awesome. Thank you. So yeah. Much I appreciate the support and all the kind words very much. Absolutely. But yep. uh, yeah, we'll make sure to put, uh, provide all the links to the different content that mm-hmm. Brian uh, and his team are responsible for. And we appreciate everybody stopping by. Brian, we hope you have a great rest of your day and a uh, great weekend. And until next time, everybody, take care and have fun. Same See to you, guys. gents. Bye. See Bye. ya.